I've lived everywhere, man, in Texas anyway, from Waco to Lubbock, Corpus to El Paso, Dallas to San Antonio, with Houston in between. From the defenders of the Alamo centuries ago to Medal of Honor winners of today, we don't ever want to forget the contributions our Mexican-American forefathers have made to enrich the lives of all Texans. We also want to recognize today's rising stars that are paving the way for Texas' next 200 years. May God bless Texas. This is Tex-Mex TV. Hi, thank you for joining us today. My name is Orlando Salazar, and this is the very first episode of Tex-Mex TV. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. We are starting off with a bang, no pun intended, Phil. <laughs> uh, our uh, first guest, which we're thrilled to have, is Phil Jordan, a.k.a. Uh, Felipe Jordan. And he was born in El Paso, Texas, and he has an amazing career in law enforcement, working with the DEA. He was special agent in charge of this part of the United States from Dallas onto the western part of Texas. And he was also the director of EPIC, the El Paso Intelligence Center. And it was all about drug enforcement. And Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. We're so fortunate to have you today. Um, we have a few things in common. Yes. Uh, you're born and raised in El Paso. Yes. I lived in El Paso for a short period of time. You played college sports at the University of New Mexico. Yes, sir. And I played college sports at UTEP. Yes. So that's about the only few things that we have in common. Because your career was amazing, and we're going to talk about that today. But tell us about just being in El Paso, growing up in El Paso, and what that was like. Well, obviously, I cannot say anything negative about El Paso. It was my home. Uh, I owe my life to El Paso. I was born in El Paso, and uh, I would recommend to anybody to go visit El Paso. And you grew up right on the border, right next to the bridge that connects El Paso and Juarez. Cordoba Bridge, yeah. yeah. What yes. was that like? It was no problems. Not like today that, uh, you know, with all the killings in um, Juarez, but um, nothing like Chicago, though. Oh, <laughs> I mean, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, no, it was... Uh, it was a different time and, and, and different dangers. Yeah. Um, you had a big family yes. in El Paso. I mean, you were spread out all over the place. About 5,000 relatives in yeah. El Paso right now. Yeah. So tell us about that, growing up with so many relatives in El Paso. Everywhere you went, you had family members. That's correct. A, a large family. Um, my mom and dad came from large families in, 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 in itself. And uh, that's when I was born, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, my father in uh, World War II. Yes. Um, and believe it or not, in um, some part in Texas, in uniform with my mother, and he was training in um, Paris, Texas, uh, they denied him um, a hamburger um, with uniform in Paris, Texas. Wow. Uh, obviously, I was too young. But, uh, but that was a story related to, to me by my parents. Well, my mom grew up in Bastrop <clears throat> and uh, similar stories being yes. uh, Mexican-American in that part of Texas. Uh, so I know some of those stories. She was not allowed to go to school with the quote unquote Anglo kids at that, right. at that time. Right. So she didn't actually go to high school with, or school with Anglo kids till she, till she was in high school. So unfortunately those things happened, but you know what? We didn't let, let those things keep us down, did we? No. No, I did not, and, and, and most of my friends did not either. Absolutely not. And, and you're gonna, you are a, uh, an example for all of us. So you went to the University of New Mexico and you played basketball? Yes, for Bob King. And, and tell us about that. Well, uh, until I was going over some of my old pictures, I realized that I'm the original number 23. That's right, <laughs> so with the last name Jordan. Jordan, yes. 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 Uh, yeah, they even named some shoes after me. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I like that. No, no. I would take that if I were no, you. No, I, no. I, I, I saw Michael play every game that they played in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, so I would never miss those games. Sure. But um, so the how only did thing you, I couldn't did, do was fly. How did you, exactly, well, who can, right? Yeah. So tell me about basketball. How did you end up playing basketball? Well, I, I was 
Playing against, uh, in high school, I played against Nolan Richardson. Oh, yes, Nolan. of course. A former and, University of Arkansas coach. Yeah, yeah, and uh, won the NCAA. And, yes. Uh, a great person, a great person, uh, a great leader, uh, and a great coach. Uh, so we were rivals in high school. He was one year ahead of me, but, but we were always in contention fighting for the scoring championship. I played for a coach, Tom Chavez, who was more conservative, uh, we had to pass the ball more, mm -hmm. and I tell Nolan, kiddingly, that he didn't have any uh, restraints, so he yeah. shot more than I did. That's why he would beat me in the scoring championship. What was your scoring average in high school? I don't recall, but it was in the, um, in those days, 15 to 18 points. Yeah, okay. but you were only scoring 40, 50 points a game as a school, right? Yeah, as a well, team. Yeah, 60s, yeah. maybe in the 60s. So you scored at least 30, 40% of the team's points. Well, um, uh, yes, I, <laughs> I, I have to admit that I did score. Yeah. So I, you, I made all this trick. And well, way to go. That's what got me my scholarship. Sure. Now, you had a chance to go to A&M. Yes, I did sign with A&M, and then they farmed me out to Ellen Military Academy, and then at a basketball tournament, um, New Mexico uh, scouted me, offered me a scholarship to, because it's closer to El Paso. Sure. So I jumped at the, at, yeah. at the chance. And, yeah. Any regrets that you didn't go to A&M? No. No? No, no. I, um, I, I really loved the University of New Mexico. They, awesome. they treated me well. Now, while you were at New Mexico, and you, you were thinking about going to law school. Yes, sir. Uh, and... I was that was a dream of your dad's. He wanted you to go to law school. My grandfather. Your grandfather. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I was offered um, this opportunity. Within, it was called the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Now it's called the EA. Um, and I didn't even know the FBN existed, Federal Bureau of Narcotics. I thought the FBI covered everything. Uh, but then I, I joined. I was agent number 207. That means that I was uh, the... Number 207, I mean, hired. Right. Uh, that's all the agents we had at that time. Yeah. And then now we're in the 1500s, I think. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. So you started as an agent. As an agent. Working out of what city? Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. Albuquerque, New Mexico. So tell us about those early days uh, at the DEA. Well, um, ironically, you were hired and then you were sent to school to learn the tr tricks of the trade, okay. Um, my first day on the job, my supervisor, uh, his name was um, John Kelly, comes in and hands me a gun, hands me a badge, and I said, I'm an agent. <laughs> I mean, I get sworn in. Sure. Um, but uh, then they said- no, no training. No training. Wow. And then on my second day on the job, he's got me on surveillance at this one uh, hotel where there was a um, dope peddler staying there. Um, but then, you know, you get all the training. And, but most of the training I got was from my counterparts, state police and, and Albuquerque police. That's where, it, where I really got my training, uh, working with those guys. Yeah, guys that had practical experience. Yes, sir. Nitty gritty stuff. On the job. Yep. So you worked for several years um, out of Albuquerque you started developing a reputation. Well, uh, undercover. Yeah, yes. I worked a lot of undercover cases. Because you spoke Spanish. Yes. Oh, yeah. That, that, that was a critical element. Yep. And uh, that made me succeed in the fact that I could communicate with the traffickers mm -hmm. uh, that had close relationships with the mafia in Mexico or the cartels in Mexico. Now, at this point, you had no idea this early stages of your career, you had no idea how huge the drug business was in Mexico. I had no idea. I started developing that idea as soon as I got my on-the-job training. Um, so a book was written about your life. Down by the River. Down by the River. And I encourage everyone watching the show to, uh, to buy this book and read this book. It is unbelievable. The things that you've gone through are really incredible, not just as your career, but your family and um, your overall experiences in, in this business. Um, 
So I have a lot of pull quotes from the book yes. that I want to use uh, as we move no, forward. No problem. Yep. Uh, it was written by Charles Bo Bowden, Bowden, and he spent a lot of time with you, didn't he? Yes, sir, he did. And your family. And the family. You know, he, he knows the family backwards in, in every which way. Now, uh, pardon me for reading this, but the author says that the story of drugs is erased as quickly as it happens that it's been absorbed into the fabric of governments, banks, and capitalism. Tell us about that quote. Well, if you <clears throat> notice the problems that we're having right now, you, you know, worldwide with the drugs, uh, it's a, it's a billion dollar industry, okay? Um, Mexico depends a lot on, on the narco trafficking, as we call it. Unfortunately, we've had our problems on this side of the border, not just Mexico. And uh, that was evident, as you saw in the uh, last NARC, um, where we had government participation in the smuggling of cocaine into the United States. Well, we're going to get to that uh, story about that, that um, um, NARC. documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a little bit. But... The other thing that comes out early in the book is that the official history of the it is the official history of the corruption of Mexico is narcotics is drugs. I mean, yes. they, it is now interwoven in Mexico's history. Yes, uh, just about every um, decision that's made in Mexico is narco related. Uh, if there is such a word as a narco democracy or a narco government, uh, Mexico would fit under it. But uh, we're not innocent in 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 when I describe Mexico. Right. Uh, so um, there's a lot of um, enabling that went on, right? With and we're gonna, and we're going to touch on those things. Um, it's amazing the the detail that the author goes to goes through in the book about the presidents of Mexico. Yes, how corrupt the presidents of Mexico were. A hundred percent. Yep. Uh, and and I'm not talking about just one president. Oh, all of them. All of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the stories which really shocked me was the fact that Carlos Salinas yes. executed his, the, one of the little girls that was working in his house. Yes. I mean, that is, I, that is unbelievable. And, of course, nothing happens. They were little kids, and they, they decided they're going to play this game, and they actually killed this little girl. I mean, I, I can't even fathom that. Right. No, it, it, it's, it's a ruthless type of business, uh, and unfortunately... Corruption is at the bottom line. Now, at some point, you moved to Dallas. I was transferred. Okay. And that's when you became special agent in charge uh, here in Dallas. Of the Dallas division, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Your family's back home. And one of the main storylines in the book is the fact that your brother is murdered. Yes, he was. Um, tell us about that. I haven't read the whole book, so I don't know the end of the story. Right. But he had done somebody a favor. He had driven a pickup truck to a Kmart to meet somebody there. Yes. He, mm -hmm. And he had been working at uh, Men's, Men's Warehouse, Warehouse selling suits. And he goes and he drives his brand new pickup yes. to the Kmart for somebody else to pick up, and he gets killed. That's correct. It was not his pickup. It was the manager's pickup who had a boyfriend working at Kmart, and he goes and does the favor to the manager, delivers the pickup. As he delivers the, the uh, truck, um, there's a 13-year-old individual kid that jumps out of a bed of, a pick, of another pickup and shoots him uh, two or three times. Uh, I was just coming home from a basketball game for my kids here in Dallas, and when I got the news, so I figured that he was going to survive, but he didn't. Right. Yeah. The, and that was the uh, Amado Carrillo. He, those individuals that killed my brother had ties to the Amado Carrillo Fuentes organization, the Juarez cartel. Now, you, you mentioned Amado Carrillo is mentioned in the book pretty early and how yes. powerful he was. Now, in the areas of the book that I read, he was like a ghost figure. Nobody could ever really nail down where he was uh, or didn't know a whole lot about him. Now, I haven't gotten to the end of the book, but eventually, did you track him down? Oh, yes. Yeah. No. Okay. We, we had him tracked down all, all, all the way up to the point where 
he was having a facelift in uh, Mexico City, and um, and then he was injected um, with a chemical and that expired him. Okay. And, and was this a plant? Was this done on purpose, or was that an accident that he died? No, I think it was planned, but not by the DEA, as far as I know. By some of his uh, but uh, it was enemies, either, or either another three other cartels agency from yeah. the government, uh -huh. or uh, from the U.S. government, or or his own uh, enemies. Now, one of the stories in here that really, to me, kind of captures the shocking aspect of how everything is intertwined is that. You bust a guy at DFW airport carrying 28 million bucks. He's charged, he's brought in, and then you get a call and you're told, let him go. Not only that, I'm told to release the money to an attorney. Uh, I, I believe he was the son of, of um, uh, Henry Wade, who was the uh, district attorney when Kennedy was uh, assassinated. Uh, so, and that's the only time in my career that I got a call from the Attorney General of the United States, acting, he was acting. The, the name, if I recall it, would be very familiar today. Mm -hmm. But he was acting at that time. And it was 28 to $29 million, and we gave it back. And I, la I later found out that that was um, CIA-related type drug money. Now, this was early on in your career as a director here. Yeah, I was a special agent, special in, agent in charge in, in Dallas. Was that shocking to you? Was that surprising to you? Yes, yes, it was very surprising because um, any, that type of money uh, is not uh, what you would call... Um, it's not chicken feed. <laughs> no, it's not chicken feed. <laughs> yeah, product. that's a lot of money. Yes, sir. Now, we reach a point where Janet Reno comes and has a meeting with you. At Epic. At Epic in El Paso. And then you start telling her about the extensiveness of the drug connections to the highest levels in Mexican leadership. In the Mexican government. And, we gave her a, a total and, picture. And she's shocked. She's shocked. She had no idea. She claimed not to have any idea. Ah. I mean, but I... I I could, now, you uh, say in the book says she's taking a lot of notes. She is. She is. She's, she took a lot of notes, and she was shocked that we are telling her about the in-depth corruption in Mexico. And I was surprised that she was surprised. Right, okay? right. I thought she would have already known a little bit about what's going on in Mexico. Um, but um, do you think she was uh, acting? Do you think she was acting or do you think she was truly surprised? You know, I, I would have to 50-50 that. I, okay. I, don't, I, I, I don't know that she should not have been surprised. Now, the book touches on the, um, the story that was in Prime, Amazon Prime. Okay. About uh, Kiki Camarena. Camarena. Now, you knew Kiki Camarena. Yes, yep. sir. Because I have a, a picture here where you are standing with, with Kiki. And, uh, nine months nine before months. he was uh, murdered. Right. Now, he was in Guadalajara. Yes. And tell me why he was there. Well, he's, he was a working agent. Uh, there was a, maybe a three, no, four or five agent office in Guadalajara. I was doing an audit of the offices in Mexico at the time. And uh, I'm with Kiki. I asked for Kiki to pick me up. I knew the type of agent. He's an ex-Marine. Right. Actually, never an ex-Marine, but he was a Marine. Right, yeah. A and, uh, and, I, and I went with him everywhere he took me uh, in a pickup. Right. Okay? Um, I got my weapon from Kiki to carry and so forth and so on because you're not supposed to carry weapons in Mexico. Right. Um, but we did it. Anyway, um, and long story short, we were followed everywhere. And I even told Kiki, I said, Kiki, you know those guys sitting over there? They've got their 45s. Don't worry about them. They work for the CIA and for the DFS. So don't worry about them. That night, I went, stayed at the Guadalajara Hilton. Um, slept, I slept well. Yeah. I mean, I, as Kiki's telling me, 
not to worry, I'm not going to worry. Sure. Little did I know that they were already planning something. So at this point in time, I want to uh, run the, uh, the, the, the uh, trailer for the documentary, um, The Last Narc. I remember being at a gym when all of a sudden news comes on the screen and I stopped. I said, oh my God, they've got Kiki. Kiki always wanted to do the right thing. At 18, he wanted to be an FBI agent. Kiki was one of the guys that you would want on your team. He was good at what he did, and he inflicted tremendous pain on the cartel. And they were not going to take that sitting down, and they did. Yo tengo de principio al fin la muerte de Kiki. I remember the children coming home. I had to tell them that he had been tortured. My mission was to find out everything that happened to Kiki from the time he got picked up to the time he died. Kiki Camarena was picked up because he was about to uncover the U.S intelligence officials was protecting the drug lords. There's layers and layers of this case. There's never been a war on drugs. Kiki was uncovering stuff that was unbelievable. The DEA headquarters told Hector, stop investigating the murder of Kiki Camarena. The Camarena case is being covered up to this day. I'm fearful that my own government is going to kill me. I want the world to know the truth. interviewed in that documentary. Yes, yes, I was. Um, it really shows the complexity of the relationship between the United States and Mexico. Correct, correct. Tell me about that. Tell me about the, the need for Mexico continuing to survive on that economy and then countries like the United States taking advantage of it? Well, first of all, um, Mexico cannot survive without the narco dollars, okay? When you have, like, like a, you mentioned President Salinas, his brother, um, big time uh, smuggler, right. uh, heroin trafficker. Then you've got, in this current administration, you have a guy that is a conduit. Mexican administration. Mexican administration. Yeah. <laughs> in the Mexican administration, you have somebody that was involved in the murder of Kiki Camarena. He's still in the cabinet of Lopez Obrador. Okay? Um, so you, it's, it's an impossible task to overcome those um, mountains and mountains of uh, corruption. But, and, but we have corruption on both sides. Sure. I want to make sure that, that it's right. clear. Right. Are you surprised that more agents haven't been killed in this whole situation with drugs between the United States and, and Mexico? Uh, I'm surprised, yes. But because of Kiki and what the response that we had after Kiki was cowardly murdered by the cowards, uh, uh, they hesitate not to mess with the EA agents. Right. Uh, or any federal agent for that matter, even though we've had, uh, when um, Eric Holder was allowing weapons to go to Mexico, right? Um, uh, we, did, we did have a couple of agents killed. Yes, yes. But not uh, DEA. Right. Now, the twist in this miniseries <clears throat> documentary is that there was a CIA agent, CIA agent present while Kiki was being murdered. He is went under the undercover name of Mex Gomez, and now he's Felix Rodriguez. He was what we call, or I call, a, a CIA operative. And that SOB, for, for lack of a better word, did not have any business touching Kiki Camarena when he was being tortured. And he did. 
The reason I know that is because the three witnesses that you, there's actually four witnesses, but three that I talked to told me that Felix Rodriguez touched Tiki Camarena. And, um, and that's a whole other story. But why would they, they even allow it? How can we can have our own guy present when one of our other fellow Americans is being tortured and killed? How can we allow that to happen? It went under the cover of national security. Uh, Kiki found out, not the Buffalo Ranch plantations of Caro Quintero. He found out about the Veracruz Ranch. And they wanted to find out what DEA knew about the CIA operations in the Veracruz Ranch, where Caro Quintero, uh, Fonseca, Felix Gallardo, uh, and the CIA were in partnership. They were flying in the cocaine into uh, Veracruz, and the cash they received, they used that cash to fight the war in Nicaragua. The Contras. The Contras. So this goes all the way up to, our, in, to Washington, D.C., because the American government, government, the Congress, could not get monies to fund that effort it would be in violation of the law if they if if they used government funds to fight the war so what they did they used illicit illegal type money by selling in, uh, cocaine to the drug lords and transporting it from south america to the united states and there were some very high up officials that were aware of this i mean one of the top officials that i'm aware of was um, um, Lieutenant Oliver North. Correct. Do you believe that he was aware of all that was going on, especially with the death of Kiki Camarena? There is no doubt in my mind, based on what the witnesses told me, where he was described as attending parties. And you know, a Mexican celebration party, whatever, baptism, whatever, these witnesses tell me that he was there w alongside uh, the CIA operative uh, Felix Rodriguez, uh, on, among others. There's another one uh, involved in there, too. Well, it is very disappointing, very disheartening to know about some of the things that our government is involved with. And I hope and pray that things have gotten better. I, I don't know what your experience has been, but do you think things are, things are better? They're not where I would like to see it be at, okay? I, but um, there's a little bit of progress being made. But as long as there's corruption, um, there's going to be ways to... Uh, there's just too much money involved. Too much money involved. Too yeah. much money involved. And it's too easy. And Yes, and then if you have, like the presidents of Mexico, all of them at one point or another have been involved in receiving... Uh, protection money from the from the drug lords. I mean, I knew uh, Comandante Calderone used to deliver uh, suitcases of money to Los Pinos. Los Pinos is the White House. Uh, Mexico, so, yeah. um, as long as there's corruption, uh, we have a problem. And as long as we have a demand on this side of the border, exactly. Uh, you know, we're we're up up. You know, we're running up at, at the hill. Well. Um... Tell us something about your life that we wouldn't know that's in the book. That's uh, not, I'm sorry, that's not in the book. That's not in the book. Um, uh, I have um, beautiful grandchildren. Yeah. And, you have a picture uh, there. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, they're uh, cowboy fans. Uh, but as of last week, I didn't think they were going to be Cowboy fans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, uh, but, Cowboys uh, came back and won. Yeah, I know. That was incredible. That was an incredible game. Um, but, um, but no, I, I, I still have Fighting Drugs with books mm -hmm. and kids programs uh, that I volunteer. High schools or col uh, universities or well, no, no, junior high? Mostly at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the middle school level. Okay, junior high school Junior level. high, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, to keep the uh, kids from um, getting involved. Uh, sports, and Nolan Richardson used to come and speak to my fighting 
drugs with sports Excellent. program. Excellent. So uh, I do believe that um, if we keep our kids involved in sports and other extracurricular activities related to the school, that uh, we can reduce the demand on this side. Right. But, um, but it's an uphill battle. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, there's a big demand. Yes, our, our as long as there's a demand, yeah. they will find out a way. And mm -hmm. if you think building a fence is going to stop it, you're mistaken. Yeah. Because there's airplanes that fly over fences, and then there's tunnels that come under S. Chapel. Right. Oh, he got his stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's good at tunnels, isn't he? Yes, oh, the, he's, he's a master. Yep. Well, we're so grateful for you as a Mexican-American who has achieved so much, one of our people, somebody that grew up in, in El Paso, and uh, we're just grateful for your leadership. At Jefferson G High School. <laughs> Jefferson High School. And I went to Austin. Yeah. I was a Panther. That was our, our rivals. That's right. I scored two points <laughs> for Austin in a in basketball game. Um, going up for a rebound or yeah, tipping the ball in. Rebound and tipped it back you tipped in. It in. Well, oh, thank you so much for doing that. Oh, okay. we, we probably <laughs> needed the help. I know. <laughs> no, but um, no, that was, uh, I recommend El Paso just like Marty Robbins does. Sure. Yeah. So. Down in the West Texas town of El Paso. Yes, sir. Well, and, Phil. And, and my, uh, uh, my, uncle, my uncle's restaurant, Forti's Mexican Elder. Still there? That's still there. Yeah. You know, I never ate at Forti's when I was there. I'd okay. go to Chico's Tacos. Oh, yeah, not too far from there. <laughs> but I, next time I know I'm in El Paso, I'll go to Forti's. Yes, please do. And uh, talk to my uh, nephew and my aunt. I will. Phil Jordan, mm -hmm. thank you for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Felipe Jordan. Jordan, the original 23. That's right, the original 23. <laughs> Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank Appreciate you. you. And if you have an idea for a story uh, that you'd like me to share on Tex-Mex uh, TV, uh, there's some information on the screen. If you, if you want to send us some information about someone, please do that. And I'm going to wrap up every show with a Vaya con Dios story. We heard a lot about today lots of money and lots of money that corrupts people. Uh, one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible is money is the root of all evil. But the Apostle Paul actually wrote the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's not the money itself. It's how we use it. Correct. Christ put it in a different way. He said that what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet lose his soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? There's not enough money on earth for anyone, a drug cartel leader, anybody, to buy themselves out of an eternity away from God. What would a person give in exchange for his soul? We don't have anything. But the wonderful thing is that God gave us something to exchange, and he gave us his son. He gave us his son to die on the cross for us. His son's soul is what he gave in exchange for ours. So as we go forward today and we think about so much money out there and everything that is around us, don't forget that Christ paid for that, that most valuable thing on earth, which is our souls, and gives us an opportunity for eternal life. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for Tex-Mex TV, Vaya con Dios, and we'll see you next time.